Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. Uh, please open your Bibles to Job chapter 34. Please open your Bibles to Job chapter 34. As we continue to look at this very interesting account of this man's life and all of the things that surround, surrounded what he went through. And, you know, we prayed, we sung tonight that, that God is our counselor. And we, we've seen in this book that he makes such, so much a better counselor than sometimes us human beings uh, because he's never wrong and he'll always lead us in the right, in the right paths. Uh, but, but we still desire those relationships, those human relationships, and they're good. We're meant to have them. It's important. Um, but if whether we're the counselor or the counselee um, or just a friend who's trying to encourage someone, we need to always be looking at the Word of God and at, and at the way God would handle these things because we don't want to give our own opinions because... As, one, as my old pastor used to say, uh, we, opinions are like belly buttons. We all have one. I don't need yours. <laughs> so um, opinions <laughs> are okay, but they're not good counsel sometimes. So uh, we're, we're going to get into the, tonight we're going get, to get through two chapters, uh, God willing. And we're going to, we're, we're kind of in the middle here of Elihu's speech. And we've already discussed how he's a very wordy person. It took him all these chapters to go through what he basically, basically reiterating what, his other, what Job's other friends had spoken of in the prior chapters. Um, <clears throat> so he continues on in his speech uh, to Job and his friends, to all who would listen. We don't know what the scene was like, how many might have been sitting or standing around and listening coming back and forth through and hearing parts of, of what Elihu had to say. Um, there were times that we read it, it sounds like he's, he might be just speaking to himself. There are times that, um, you know, because he likes to use many words, there are times that we see him encouraging his listeners to hear my words. For me, it's like he's saying, hey, wake up, I'm still here, I have more to say. I have more to say, hear my words, listen to me. And so we see him doing that even a couple of times in the chapters that we're going to look at tonight, um, encouraging them to just hear him. So they might have been tuning out. He had to bring them back a little bit. Um, we also talked about the fact that a lot of what Elihu says, as we've seen through all of Job's interaction with his friends, is biblically correct, theologically accurate. Um, and, you know, it's important as we as we should be students of the Bible, we should be not necessarily theologians, but the theology is just the study of God. And so we understand that it's a difficult thing, um, but it's also a very important thing to study, um, the, study God. We study God through the Bible as he reveals himself in the pages of the scriptures. But it benefits us. We know it benefits us to know God better. But it's also very difficult, isn't it? Because as uh, we have limits on our intellect and on our, on our thinking, we can't completely understand, completely comprehend um, this really unknowable God. You know, Paul writes about it in Romans 11. In verses 33 to 36, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who, or who has first given to him, and that sh it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So he's above all. He's unknowable in, you know, completely we don't know him completely. His ways are past finding out, but he still wants us to get to know him more. 
And so that's the kind of the challenge for us. And God has revealed himself in many ways throughout, throughout mankind, through creation. We see the attributes of God. Through prophecy, we see the mind of God. Through the Bible, which reveals God in, in, his, in his fullness, and of course through his son Jesus. There's so much about God, though, that we still don't understand. So that's why we're encouraged by the Bible to live by faith and not by sight, because um, what, that, what that tells me is that there are some things that we just um, have to take on faith. There are some things that we don't completely understand. A lot of them are those deep, um, maybe theological things that we don't get, but a lot of them are just those personal things that we don't quite understand sometimes what's going on in our own lives. So Elihu here will attempt to explain God. See, this is his grandiose speech about, you know, he's going to tell everyone now what he knows about God. Um, he's going to try to uh, explain some of the complaints that Job had about God, which he, we see the account of Job expressing some of those things expressing sometimes confusion, sometimes doubt about what he's going through. And we can relate. Definitely we can relate. You know, I was having a conversation a week or so ago with somebody about this, and that, and I, you know, I kind of came to the conclusion that we are all, all Job in some way. You know, for this to take up 42 chapters in the Bible, that's a long book. But I think it's done purposely because we are all Job. We may not all... God willing, we may not all uh, experience some of the things that Job experienced, the calamity uh, that Job did, but nevertheless, we will experience pain, we'll have suffering, we'll have loss in our life. We are all Job, and we also will experience sometimes the misunderstanding and the doubt and the questioning of God and his ways. So this is a really relatable book to each of us if we, if we des desire to see that. And so we're going to jump in here in the first nine verses, and we're going to see what Elihu has to say. So it says, starting in verse 1, Elihu further answered and said, Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you who have knowledge. For the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Let us choose justice for ourselves. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job has said, I am righteous, but God has taken away my justice. Should I lie concerning my right? My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. What man is like Job, who drinks scorn like water, who goes in company with the workers of iniquity, and who walks with wicked men? For he has said, it profits a man nothing that he should delight in God. So Elihu here is kind of mixing a lot of different things into these verses. He's going to attempt to answer some of Job's complaints and explain God's ways, but he also condemns Job for Job's lack of faith. And he, he, he reminds me of modern-day politicians sometimes. They tell the listeners to, um, to listen to them. They have something very important to say, very wise and, it's, and actually, you're very wise even listening to me because I have so much important information to give you. And then, he goes, then they go on and they say things that are inaccurate. And you wonder to yourself, well, am I wise for listening to this person? They just told me I was. So they kind of, they a backhanded compliment and then actually very prideful saying I have a lot of important things to say and you're very wise even listening to me. But then they kind of, they say things that are untrue. He flatters his listeners, something he said I, in the very first part of his speech, he said, I won't use flattery, but then he does. And then he flatters himself. And then he says, well, if, you're, if wise and knowledgeable men are listening to me, then I must have something very important to say. So again, it's, a lot about Elihu and not as much about Job or God, but he, he gets there. 
He, he urges his listeners to test his words, which is a good thing to do, like a food critic would taste the meal or test the meal, and that they would come away not full in their bellies, but intellectually satisfied if they just test his words. But then he goes on and he rebukes Job for his complaints against God and about, about how he was treated by God. And his representation of Job is not completely accurate. It's true, and we've read the accounts, that Job sometimes complained. He sometimes complained about his circumstances. Sometimes he complained that the wicked were prospering while the righteous seemed to suffer. He didn't quite get it. And Elihu here kind of takes those words and twists them around a little bit and condemns Job for them. But he doesn't factor in, like a lot of times we don't, Job's genuine pain, Job's genuine suffering. You know, sometimes when we're having a conversation with somebody and they may be, you know, doubting or complaining or wondering what's going on in their lives, we may, and our initial reaction might be, well, what kind of faith do you have? You call yourself a Christian and yet you doubt, you don't understand, and, you know, don't we all suffer? But I think we need to take a step back, which is what Elihu did not do here, take a step back and realize that this person that's standing in front of us is really suffering. Don't take out the human aspect of your conversations or relationship with others. It's very important. It, it's, it's, it's okay to understand and give biblical counsel, but we cannot take the human aspect out of it when someone's suffering. We're going to go on, move on to verses 10 to 15, where Elihu here attempts to present proof that God is completely just and fair. Again, a good thing that Elihu does. And a lot of the things that he says are, are accurate and biblical. But we'll see where he kind of goes off a little bit. So starting in verse 10, Therefore listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to commit iniquity. For he repays man according to his work and makes man to find a reward according to his way. Surely God will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. Who gave him charge over the earth, or who appointed him over the whole world? If he should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together, and man would return to dust. So, Elihu is presenting this idea of absolute justice and rightfully saying that God is always perfectly fair. But that's, you know, sometimes we take some of the things that the Bible says and we make a spiritual law out of it when it's really not a spiritual law, it's more a general principle. Because we see that things don't always go according to the way we think they should. See, a lot of people will misapply or misinterpret God's word as a spiritual law when actually it needs to be interpreted in context. A lot of things in the Bible seem black and white, but others need to have that quality of context in order to see if they're accurate or not. Well, I remember when we were studying the book of Proverbs together, this was really very important because the Prov book of Proverbs would state certain things, if this, then that, but it wouldn't always apply. So like in uh, Proverbs 10, 27, it says, the fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Well, not always, right? The righteous don't always live a good long life. And matter of fact, it's been said that the good die young, right? Sometimes that's the way it works. So these are general principles, but they're not spiritual laws. They're not something that are absolute. Uh, Proverbs 11.24 says, There is one who scatters, yet, it, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Now, as a general principle, certainly being generous is better than being stingy. But we know 
that there are some that are greedy and they continue to get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. So it's a general principle, but not necessarily a spiritual law. See, Elihu here does what a lot of us do sometimes, um, and that is to try to put God in a neat package so that we'll be able to understand his ways. But God knows the inner motives and the struggles that we all go through. And he judges according to his perfect knowledge, not according to some black and white, this is the way it is, it always is like that but he individually sees what's going on. It's true, as Elihu stated, that God will never do wicked, wickedly or pervert justice. And he used those statements as he was trying to tell Job that there's no basis for Job to question what's going on in his life. But Job knows, knew, knew better, and he stated as such throughout some of his uh, dialogue, that he knows that it's not always the way we think it should be. Remember, there's a human ele element that we must never leave out. Our questioning of God, which can be done, needs to be done in a respectful way. You know, we can cry out to the Lord in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our suffering. We can ask for clarity when we don't understand. But we always have to rely, sort of fall back and rest on God's sovereignty. Elihu, and a lot of times in, the, in, in this, the book of Job, emphasizes God's sovereignty. From the very first chapter, we see that Satan had to get God's permission to even afflict Job in the first place. So we see God's sovereignty throughout the book. But certainly, we know that, that not everything happens the way we would expect it. And so our doubts and our questioning, done respectfully, crying out to the Lord, and sometimes he will show us, and sometimes we just have to get through it. And we'll know it as we look back, oh, now I understand God, right? Sometimes it takes us, it, it being in the rearview mirror, for us to really understand better. Moving on here, jo, um, Elihu goes on here now to explain how God's justice, because remember, everything that human beings um, should aspire to has to come from God first. So knowing that God is perfectly just, that's the only way that human beings can be just, because it has to come from God. We'll see how he makes that connection, which is, a, which is an accurate and proper connection. So in verses 16 through 20, he says, If you have understanding, hear this. Listen to the sound of my words. Should one who hates justice govern? Will you condemn him who is most just? Is it fitting to say to a king, you are worthless, and to nobles, you are wicked? Yet he is not partial to princes, nor does he regard the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. In a moment they die, in the middle of the night. The people are shaken and pass away. The mighty are taken, without, taken away without a hand. So this attribute of God here that we desire in our human leaders, this attribute of God demonstrates his perfect moral order. The way, this is the way things should be. That when, when human leaders make decisions, that it's always the right decision. That it's always justice, perfect justice. Isn't that what we desire in our human um, leaders and in our court system? Isn't that what we desire? So God's perfect moral order, God's perfect way of dealing with justice allows men to make the same choices. It can only come from God. See, sometimes men do make choices that are outside of God's will. But even in that, he'll eventually bring things back into perfect harmony with the way he 
had planned things to be, his perfect order of things. And when we have leaders, um, whether they're good leaders or bad leaders, um, it doesn't matter. Uh, we should be praying for them. We should always be praying for godly wisdom because he's the only one that can give it. Romans 13.1 tells us, let, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, we've talked about this before. It seems like that is not always true. <laughs> Uh, if we look out and we see some of the wicked leaders, not, all, not just, I'm not just talking about currently in our country or in our state, but I mean, look back in history. You know, and to think that the authorities that were put in place were actually appointed by God, you know, that's hard to, hard to imagine. That's one of those things where we, we can't really comprehend it. But remember, God's given each and every person free will, Right? to do as he as would be honoring to him or not. And Elihu also accuses Job here of condemning God in his handling of Job's circumstances. And Job did cry out for relief, but he never condemned God. He never blamed God. Remember, in the very first chapter, right after all of this took place, he says, in all of this, it says, in all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He did not. So, you know, Elihu is saying some very true things, but he's also doing some mischaracterization of Job. Moving on in the next few verses, in verses 21 to 30, he continues here to proclaim God's perfect justice. And it says, for his eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. For he need not further consider a man that he should go before God in judgment. He breaks in pieces mighty men without inquiry and sets others in their place. Therefore, he knows their works. He overthrows them in the night, and they are crushed. He strikes them as wicked men in the open sight of others because they, are, they turn back from him and would not consider any of his ways so that they cause the cry of the poor to come to him. For he hears the cry of the afflicted. When he gives quietness, who then can make trouble? And when he hides his face, who then can see him? Whether it is against a nation or a man alone, that the hypocrite should not reign, lest the people be ensnared. So again, looking at, at man and, and seeing that stark contrast between God's perfect righteousness and sometimes the wickedness of men. So Elihu is, a, again, attempting to kind of prove that God's perfect justice is evident. If he were unfair, he's saying, then he must not see what's going on in the, in, in the world. But he does. He does see. Sometimes we think that God must be turning a blind eye, right? Because he must not see what's going on in the world. But he does. God sees everything. Hebrews 4.13 tells us there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Very important part of that verse. To whom we must give account. Now, if you had an opportunity probably to sit down with one of the wicked leaders in, in, the, in the world over the uh, past millennium, uh, you'd probably ask them, um, do, you, do you realize that you have to give account? You have to give an account to God for you, what you did. They'll probably say, no, I don't. They probably won't believe in God. I would venture to say that that most wicked leaders who we've had in, you know, throughout the course of human history are also atheists. They do not believe that God exists or else they would realize that they do have to give an account. They do. The record of men and nations that have been judged by God throughout human history is evident 
God sees men's deeds, whether good or evil, and he will perfectly judge all of them. There's no favoritism, in other words, in God's eyes, as like there is with men. You know, we, we favor. We favor the wealthy. We favor, favor the successful. We favor the, the famous. We tend to do that. But God doesn't do that. We tend to judge people on, on kind of their outward appearance or the clothes they wear or the car they drive or the house they live in. We show favoritism, but God doesn't. In James 4, 11 and 12, it tells us about this. It says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver, God, one who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge one another? See, we're not impartial in the way we judge. God is impartial in his judgment of men. And he has to do that because he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny his own nature. In verse 30, it says that the hypocrite should not reign lest the people be ensnared. You know, imagine if God was not perfectly impartial in his judgment then the hypocrite would reign. And the people that are under him would be trapped. Sometimes evil men do get into positions of power. And when that happens, men become ensnared. They're trapped. They're not free. They're not truly free. We go through history. We can see proof of that. But remember, God will fairly judge them all. And that's something we always, always have to remember. Now, in those, these uh, last few verses here, um, Elihu here is kind of, he's, he's judging Job, e even as he's telling uh, the, the listeners not to judge. So he says in verses 31 to 33, For has anyone said to God, I have borne chastening, I will offend no more. Teach me what I do not see. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Should he repay it according to your terms, just because you disavow it? You must choose and not I, therefore speak what you know. So Elihu here is kind of judging Job, he's judging others, and he's telling us not to do so. He feels the need again here to exhort his listeners to hear him to hear him. These are very important words. He's telling them that repentance and confession of sin is what Job needed to do. Is what Job needed to do. And this is the problem with Job's situ situation, that he hasn't repented. He hasn't confessed. And he tries to give Job advice. He's right, though, in saying that God is a sovereign judge. If we are in sin and we repent from that sin and turn from that sin, God will forgive us. You know, sometimes, though, even as we apply this to our lives, you know, we can be harsh on people, like Elihu here is on, on Job. We can be harsh on people because we don't, maybe we don't recognize a spirit of humility in them, you know, or uh, uh, we don't, there's no outward repentance, sign of repentance in them. But I don't know about you, but I know for me, sometimes that is a process more than just a turn a switch on or off type thing in our lives. You know, sometimes change does come quickly, but sometimes it's a gradual thing in our lives. And we can relate to that. We know that. We need to be careful that we don't, we're not too quick to be harsh um, to about, about what people are, are going through and the fact that, that their, their repentance and their change might just take a little longer. But we're there to encourage them, right? 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's promise is there. 
So eventually when we get around to it, um, you know, if it's, if it's one of those things that just takes us a while to understand or comprehend or get past, then he'll forgive us. But I think that we can also ask for forgive, forgiveness on a daily basis. Sometimes the cleansing takes a little longer. But the day-to-day, just like Peter said, you know, about the washing of the feet, the washing of the feet is a daily thing. The forgiveness, the, re- the confession is a daily thing. Therefore, the forgiveness is a daily thing. But sometimes the cleansing comes a, a, on a more of a long-term basis. But all of that is part of God's plan and how he deals with us. He finishes up here with, with a couple of more harsh accusations against Job. In verses 34 to 37, it says, men, men of understanding say to me, wise men who listen to me, Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without wisdom. Oh, that Job were tried to the utmost because his answers are, those, are like those of wicked men. For he adds rebellion to his sin, he claps his hands among us, and he multiplies his words against God. So three things here he, he accuses Job of doing. And you know, not only did he sin, but he's rebelling against God, you know, by questioning God, by doubting God. Remember, he never accused God, but there were moments there where he was in such pain that he cried out to God and And, you know, Elihu characterizes this as rebelling. And then he claps his hands among us, which which back then is is a sign of derision. It's not like today where you give somebody a, a, you know, a a standing ovation and it's because you like them so much. Back then you clap your hands among people and it's it's a sign of disrespect toward them. So that's what Job was doing to, you know, he says Job was doing to them. And then multiplying his words against God. You know, God is not tired of hearing our our many words. God is not tired of our prayers. He's not like that unrighteous judge who's sick of hearing the complaints of the of the you know of the widow. We can continue to go to him. He's okay with that. Sometimes we think to ourselves, no, God, I know I I asked you for this yesterday. Or I've confessed this sin already three times this week. God, I know you're probably sick of hearing me. No, he's not. No, he's not. He doesn't, he wants that relationship. So what Elihu was saying against Job here made no sense. He multiplies his words against God? No. God wants to hear us. Even if there's complaint, even if there's doubt, even if there's confusion, he wants that open dialogue. So we're going to jump into chapter 35 because it's only a few, it's only 16 verses. We're going to go through it because it continues in this address here that Elihu has of Job's complaints against God. And he says here in verses 1 through 3, moreover, Elihu answered and said, do you think that this is right? Do you say my righteousness is more than God's? For you say, What advantage will it be to you? What profit shall I have more than if I had sinned? So Elihu here does a couple of things that are good. He does a couple of things that are wrong. He maintained um, that Job said he was righteous before before God, but he never said that he was perfect. So Elihu kind of misrepresents what Job said. He never said he was more righteous than God. He said he was righteous in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. And remember, God agreed with him. He also never said that there's no difference between sinning and not sinning. There's no difference between sinning and not sinning. You see, some people will say, well, since God isn't judging me, you know, he hasn't struck me down, he hasn't, you know, uh, he's, I'm still being blessed. So obviously, he doesn't care if I sin or I don't sin. Well, that's, that's not true. That's not, that's not what God says. See, God's, God's uh, pres- presumed or per, uh, perceived slowness in judgment is really his mercy. That's really what it is. 
No, 1 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, speaking of that perceived slowness in the return of Jesus to finally judge sin, right? But how many of us are glad that he hadn't returned before we got saved? I know I am. You know, imagine if he judged the world while we were still in rebellion. Well, then I guess his long-suffering is good, is good. But it's not a license to continue sinning. Remember, um, God's grace abounds when sin abounds. But Paul addressed this in his, in his uh, letter to the Romans. You know, sometimes we can take that and we can twist it, but in, in chapter 5 and, ch- and the beginning of chapter 6, Paul addresses it. He says, More, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, we may think that. You know, well, I, I want to see God's grace revealed more and more and more. And how, where, is, where is his grace revealed more than anywhere else? And that is through the forgiveness of sin. But he says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So we never want to get to the point where we think, well, our sin is okay with God. And that's what Elihu was accusing Job of saying, you know, that, you know, sinning or not sinning does, makes no difference to God. But it does. And again, sin should bring conviction in our lives. Um, not sin, for, uh, confession should bring conviction. Sin also brings conviction. And it should also lead to repentance. So there's those things that we do when God's Spirit is telling us that we're going off track. But His grace is always available. His grace is always available. Verses 4 through 8, it says, I will answer you and your companions with you. Look to the heavens and see, and behold the clouds. They are higher than you. If you sin, what do you accomplish against Him? Or if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to Him? If you are righteous, what do you give him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects a man such as you are, and your righteousness a son of man. So Elihu is saying, again, reiterating the fact that our, our sin doesn't really, the, he's saying wrongly that our sin does not affect God. And it's true that we, God doesn't need anything from us, but that does not negate his desire for relationship with us. We know that God is holy, and we're not. We know that God is perfect, and we're lacking. But through faith in Jesus, we can have a close relationship with God, even though we know that we're not perfect. But if we've accepted Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, what does God do? He imputes Jesus' righteousness to us. That's that beautiful thing that happens when we receive him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So it's that beautiful thing where, yes, God uh, uh, sees our sin, understands we're sinners, but when we confess our sin and we repent of our sin and when we put our full faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and for salvation then he forgives us and now he sees us through the eyes of Christ that's a beautiful thing very beautiful thing 9 through 12 tells us because of the multitude of oppressions they cry out they cry out for help because of the arm of the mighty but no one says where is God my maker who gives songs in the night, who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of heaven. 
There they cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evil men. So there's a, there is a disconnect sometimes in our relationship with God because of our sin and because of pride. But Job was not crying out to the Lord in, in pride. He was crying out in sincerity of heart. Psalm 34, 18 tells us the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite, contrite spirit. So it's the motives of our heart that really are important to God. Many people will cry out to God in the midst of a trial. I know I do all the time. But God knows the motives. He knows what's behind that. If there's pride, he won't respond. But if, if it's done in sincerity and humility, he will. James 4, 6 says he gives more grace. Therefore, he says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Don't we desire more of God's grace in our lives as we humbly just fall on him and submit to his ways? That's exactly what he's looking for. So we reach out to the Lord. We reach out to him in humility. And we recognize that God is our creator and our Lord. And then he, and then he closes it up here with one more jab. I think uh, he's taken here. One more shot at Job. Um, he calls it empty talk. In verses 13 through 16, as we close up, surely God will not listen to empty talk, nor will the Almighty regard it. Although you say you do not see him, Yet justice is before him, and you must wait for him. And now, because he has not punished in his anger, nor taken much notice of folly, therefore Job opens his mouth in vain, he multiplies words without knowledge. Now, as you know, we spoke, spoke of that already. God is not tired of hearing us. Never ever get that idea in your mind that speaking to God is not in vain. It never is. And sometimes God's answer to us, if, if we don't get a, a, you know, an answer right away, sometimes it's wait. Sometimes it's wait. It's always done perfectly in God's timing. But God's timing and our timing sometimes don't, don't line up because we're always a little bit more anxious, I think. You know, for us, you know, we, we, we continue to see these interactions between Job and his friends and Job and Elihu and uh, another couple of chapters, and then we're going to start to hear from God directly, which uh, I, I'm really looking forward to. But these lessons are, are important to us because Elihu's points were mostly made apart from context, apart from the humanity that goes into um, how we relate to one another. But when we apply these things to our individual circumstances or to the circumstances of others, we need to have more understanding of, of the human element, of the emotions, of the, of the heart, of everything that's going on in people's lives. And I think that's important for us as we see, kind of a lot of times we see the wrong way to relate to others, but we also see the, uh, some of the right things to do. But we need to be able to pick those things out. We can thank God that one thing, he doesn't use that kind of a cookie-cutter approach with any of us. You know, what's good for one person is not always the same for someone else. We can't always say, well, God did it this way in my life, so therefore he's going to do it that way in your life. Not necessarily. We need to be, again, not to put God into a neat package, but to understand that he deals with us as individuals, as unique, unique people with unique circumstances. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word to us in this book and the interesting uh, things that we see in the interactions between Job and his friends. And Lord, we can, we can make application a lot of times in our lives, in our relationships. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just give us all that we need from these, um, from these studies, all that we need to relate to you better, all that we need, Lord, to um, relate to others in a way that would uh, bring comfort and peace and, um, 
and uh, good counsel and all the things that we desire to do, Lord, because we just want to be good representation of who you are to others around us. So, Lord, we just ask that you uh, continue to encourage us through these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we all stand and close in worship tonight? Thank you.